But I'd like to welcome you to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Dr. Guy Sims. I'm the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer here at the Free Library, and it's my pleasure to provide a trifecta of introductions of our in esteemed guests. I begin with a quote. As much as some people like to put down political correctness, if it wasn't for political correctness, I wouldn't be free. Poignant words that come with a smile. The trademark of our first guest, W. Kamau Bell. W. Kamau Bell is a socio-political comedian and author who hosts and executive produces the CNN original series, United Shades of America. With Kate Schatz, whom I will introduce in a moment, he is the co-writer of the new book, Do the Work, anti an anti-racist activity book. And of course, that's why you're all here this evening. Kamau tackles some of the nation's most long-standing complex issues in accessible and empowering talks for audiences of all kinds. Joining Kamau is Kate Schatz, New York Times bestselling author, activist, educator, and consultant. Kate Schatz has been talking, writing, and teaching about race, gender, social justice, and equity for many years. Her Rad Women books, Rad American Women A through Z, Rad Women Worldwide, and Rad American History A through Z, have sold over 300,000 copies and has been translated into four languages. Guiding our conversation this evening is Philly's own Dr. Mark Lamont Hill. Dr. Hill is one of the leading intellectuals in this country. He has been a social justice activist and organizer. He has worked on campaigns to end the death penalty, abolish prisons, and release numerous political prisoners. Dr. Hill has also worked in solidarity with human rights movements around the world. He is the founder and director of the People's Education Center in Philadelphia, as well as the owner of Uncle Bobby's Coffee and Books. Right on down there on Germantown Avenue. Give it up. Give it up. If you haven't been, you better get your chai lattes right there. So please sit back, relax, and expect to be enlightened. Welcome W. Kamal Bell, Kate Schott, and Mark Lamont Hill to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Thank you. Wow. Good evening, everybody. For COVID, this is sold out. This is so encouraging. Yeah, no, I was, didn't know. I didn't so know. many white people <laughs> here to Mich do the work. Mission accomplished. Do the work. No, this is really great. This is really exciting. And uh, uh, this is a wonderful book uh, that has made the New York Times bestseller list. Yes, give a round of applause. And I'm, I'm going to tell you just a, a quick quick story. I don't normally go behind the, the, the walls of, of, of uh, my own endeavors, but uh, I own a bookstore here in the city, Uncle Bobby's Coffee and Books. <laughs> and like all bookstores, the pandemic hit us hard. We were challenged uh, in lots of ways. It, a brick and mortar store, people don't walk into bookstores to buy books during a pandemic or coffee or anything else. And we decided to go online and we did okay until George Floyd was killed. The month after that day, we sold more books on race, racism, how to be an anti-racist, white fragility. We sold more books in that month than we'd sold in the previous year and a half. And we sell a lot of books. And it was many organizations, white organizations, large, predominantly white organizations. It was uh, individuals who said, I just want to understand. Oh, people called it the racial reckoning. Talk to me about what it means to be in a moment where that much of the American public is at least interested in having those conversations. I don't know if they read the books, but they bought them, <laughs> right? That's why we wrote this book, because we were like, are they going to read those books? <laughs> right. So, so talk to me about what it means to make a book in that, and against the backdrop of all of that, and, and, is, and is this book an extension of that racial reckoning too? Yeah, uh, so can I, uh, can I say? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So first before we get started, I'm not gonna like let the moment pass without saying that like Mark Lamont Hill is one of the best people I've ever met in my life. Uh -huh. <laughs> 
Whenever I call him, he answers the call, no matter how complicated the call is. <laughs> and I appreciate you and just wanted to say that in your town, just to no, be clear. Thank you. Thank, yeah, you, thank, thank you. you. All right. Thank you. All right. Now, now, I, now I'll stop crying. Okay. <laughs> so that same thing, I, we had like the people who are known to talk about racism version of what you had. I got booked on more late night talk shows that week after George Floyd than mm. I had been booked on in the previous year. Uh, I became every talk show host uh, black friend, <laughs> uh, and uh, was like, and and very quickly realized that like it, I was saying this, like I I was saying the same thing on this talk show I said on the other talk show, and at some point I was like, I can't keep repeating myself because if it didn't work on Monday, it's not going to work on Tuesday. <laughs> right. And reached out to you at one point, and I was like, and also I knew I was aware of like I was talking to white people of tremendous privilege when you're on mm. one of these talk shows, so. These people aren't just like, what do I do? You have the resources and power to do something. And so I reached out, I sent you an email mm -hmm. uh, where I was like, what? <laughs> Kate, you're good at talking to, what did it say? Do you remember? I think you said, uh, help me with white people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds right. Yeah. 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 And, and you said, uh, all these white people, uh, and then it was parentheses, not just normal white people, but like, like, Big time fancy yeah, white people. The fancy whites. Uh, the fancy whites were coming to you and saying, "What do I do?" Yeah, and that was an email. It was a bunch of O's. What do I do? You know, and then you said, "Can you can you help me out?" And I said, "Yes." It's like, send me send me your white people. Like, I, I will do what I can. <laughs> I did. I said that. And so I can't You're remember. Tired, you poor. Yeah. If the first, yeah, I can't <laughs> remember. If, was the first thing online that I sent you white people, uh, or was it Conan? Then then I said. Yes, send me your white people. Let's talk. Let's strategize. But in the meantime, direct them my way. And you took that and then went on Conan, Conan O'Brien and said that I was in charge of his whiteness. Yes. <laughs> so he took my offer very literally. Yeah, he, he read the autobiography of Malcolm X. Oh, wow. Yeah. He held up a Black Lives Matter t-shirt on TBS, which is the blackest thing to ever happen on TBS. By far. Even though they had Tyler Perry sitcoms. I mean, so, <laughs> like, it was, and, and, like, and we sort of, like, and, and I saw that you were taking it serious. She was doing Instagram lives every day, like to white, hey, white people, like you're welcome <laughs> here, and like leading like discussions and talking about and recommending books. And I already knew Kate, so I wasn't surprised. But the way you like really leaned into it, I was like, this is not a regular white person. <laughs> and I did this finger. <laughs> uh, and then we, you know, then it, then, it, then what happened next? Well, I think what happened next is to go back to your question mark was that we also realized that the moment that we were all in, the reckoning, it was a moment, you know, and we knew that it was going to pass and we knew that the interest would die down and people would get distracted and we were in a pandemic and that energy wasn't going to be sustained even though everybody then wanted to talk about burnout and how do we keep this going and it was like, we, well, we know that you're not. Um, we know that a lot of people are going to keep it going because they've been keeping it going all along this whole time. But we then Kamau was like, well, let's write a book. Um, and we that was kind of our way of keeping the energy that we had and the conversations we were having um, to keep it going. And I think that we did think about all of those books that were on the bestseller list again. Did people really read them? Did they finish them? And even if they did finish them, was it just kind of like a checklist, you know, they got to check that off their like anti-racism to-do list. And then they're good because they read the new Jim Crow. Right. Now they're solid. I voted for Obama. I read the new Jim Crow. There's like a <laughs> no. list of things. I bought Juneteenth ice cream. Right. <laughs> no. um, but I think what we were seeing too was that people just like now they have the information and what do they do? Like what mm. do they actually do? So our idea was to make a book that just gives people a ton of ideas for what they can actually do. What, what to do and also how to sort of reflect upon who they are. I mean, I think the thing I love about this book is that it doesn't just give you actionable items, although that's really important because most books, I've never written a book that it gives actionable items, right? Most of us critique and we offer analysis, but you all offer stuff that you can do when you leave the pages of the book, but you also force people to reckon with some stuff. I, I wanna pull, I wanna jump really quickly to page 39 of this incredible book. Turn to page 39 in your hymnal. This is actually my favorite. <laughs> this has been my favorite part of our events when I realize that all these people have the book and then they can turn to the page. This is so cool. Yes. Now, I'm going to read it out loud for people who don't have the book or otherwise want me to read for them. I'm not going to read all of them. I'm going to read just a few of them. I don't want a show of hands because that will encourage lying. Yes. <laughs> they, they, yes. I'm not questioning your, your collective integrity. Uh, but sometimes it's hard to raise your hand if you don't feel something that you think perhaps you should. Uh, so 
the first, it, it, and the, this is a checklist of you might be an anti-racist if. And you're, and you're supposed to check the square if the statement already applies to you and check the circle if you aspire to it. Um, the first question is, or the first statement is, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the United States of America values white lives over all other lives. For people of color accepting this is not much of a stretch, but for many white people, this can be a pretty big deal. Um, so think about, I, I just want you to sit with that question and, and, and you feel free to check a box or a circle, but you don't have to say it out loud. Um, you know that you have internalized racism and you will work to unlearn and reject it. I'm gonna skip down. Um, you don't feel the need to declare I'm not racist because you know that literally every person who does some racist bullshit says that. <laughs> That's one of my faves. I was like, I gotta get that one in. That's why this is for adults and not kids. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. You read books by people of color even when it's not February. I think that was my joke, I think that was mine. <laughs> I mean, y'all laughing, but like again, as a bookstore owner, I'm telling y'all, I, I see the patterns. Some of y'all, and sometimes you don't realize that that's what's happening, right? And yes, I mean, or you've read, you said I read Obama. I read the Obama book, I read Will Smith in the winter. Yeah. Before the, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Before, before February. Yes. Um, I can't wait for the second one. <laughs> And the last one I'm gonna read is, you listen when people of color share their experiences with white supremacy and respond in a way that validates their experiences rather than centering your own. Right. So I wanna ask just, uh, just, how many of you found this, it, let me not ask that. Um, I could imagine that some people may find these questions uneasy, mm -hmm. unsettling at times. For some it's like encour encouraging, oh I did my thing. What, is your, what was your goal, what was your expectation for, for a checklist like this? What, what do you, what do you, where do you want people to do? What kind of experience do you want them to have with this text? I think, and I think when I think about as we're putting that together and how we're putting it together, my goal, literally, one of my goals is for someone like you or Alicia Garza or Erica Huggins, if she picks it up, to pick it up and go, oh, they ain't bullshitting. <laughs> <laughs> that we're actually in this book that seems like a joke that we're actually challenging the readers. Oh, they're going hard on here, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And that we're not, I mean, as we say, like the idea was that this book is definitely like a sort of a 101 approach to becoming an anti-racist, but it goes through fairly quickly and fairly, and it's trying to get you to do it. It's set up in like five chapters and you can do them in a row and really moves you to action. But we wanted like our activist friends, if they picked up and flipped through it, knowing our work to be like, okay, they actually aren't screwing around here. Yeah. That, they, that they're used, and also we're not just, pretending we created it, we're actually pointing to the work that we're pulling this from, too, so you can go read those books. Very important, like for example, you talk about anti-racism and you, you gesture to Ibram Kendi, who's done significant work in that, in that, in that space. I actually want to ask you, uh, what does it mean to be an anti-racist to you? Mm, uh, to me, it means that you are actively engaged in anti-racist thought and action, uh, that you're not just, again, to, to go back to Kendi's definition, that it's not just being not racist, um, and being an anti-racist is an active practice, um, an ongoing, consistent, sustained behavior. And I think with that checklist, that's what we wanted to uh, come at it from a lot of different angles in that checklist, you know, really right off the bat to get people thinking of all the different ways and thought patterns that they could. Um, when you were just reading those, it reminded me, I remember when we were creating that section, I was thinking about, um, I think anybody who, who has kids and has taken them to the pediatrician, for their like <laughs> annual visits, they give you the checklist of like things that basically mean you're doing a good job and being a good parent. And right. it's really it's really tempting to be like, yeah, they don't eat sugar. No, they never have juice. Yeah, they get, oh yeah. Right. Oh, they always wear their seatbelt. Yeah, they have a bike helmet. But like when you really read it, there's wow. some that are I'm a terrible parent. I yeah. just realized at this exact moment. And like right. the moments where you you're filling that out and then you stop and you're like, ooh, wait a minute. Ooh, do I really do that? So we I kind of wanted people to have that same reaction of. I think a lot of readers will want to just breeze through that and be like, yeah, of course. I'm, and, and then I hope people get to some points and are like, I can't really honestly say that I'm doing this. Right. But I aspire to it. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, the book has hope in it. Yes. Which I appreciate. Um, if you open this book, I assume you want to get there. Um, are you worried at all that, like many other things, this book will get opened? It will get looked at? it'll become a piece of cultural capital. People will say, yeah, I have this book, at least anti-racist cultural capital, I got it. Mm -hmm. But that people won't do the work. I, I, 
do you have confidence that they will? Uh, no, but uh, <laughs> I mean, I think this, that I know that the work is hard, and the book says that the work is hard. But I also think that the thing the book is clear on is that once you finish the book, the work isn't done, which I think is super important to say. So that if you're the person who's like, I read that book a year ago, but I go to your Instagram feed and there's no evidence that you did anything, that you changed anything, or if I or if I know you in life and I'm and there's no if to me this is like reading a book about working out. <laughs> yeah. That's not the workout. Right. Right. And they sell a lot of books about working out. And only some of us have a six pack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, it's like, I, but I do really believe that there is a, a large section of American society who actually does want to get involved and leads and, and really wants to be like the same way that if you go to a personal trainer, just tell me what to do. Right. Just tell me what to do and I will do it. And if you do that, you will start to see results. I think there is a section of people who, you know, post the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Amar Arbery are like, I really do see that the system is wrong, but I just don't, I can't, I can't, I don't know where to go to begin. And so we're trying to say, and I think we've done it in such a way that like, there are lots of entry points. It's yes. not all about going to the protest. It's not all about boycotting the thing. Those are parts of it, but there are many ways. And so we have an activity in there called Know Your Lane. Yes. Which is about like literally like look around, like because you know, you, people always say stay in your lane. All right, if I stay here, what can I do to improve my lane? Right. And we use my career as an example of like ways in which in my career I've tried to improve my lane. Yes, a absolutely. Uh, how, how, what's your journey to getting here? I'm asking both of you that question. Can okay, I start with you? Um, how, for some people, they assume as a black person, it's just intuitive, but it's very, e but, but it's not, right? I mean, you, you could very easily be doing other kinds of work in the world. Uh, you could easily be doing other types of work in the world. What's your journey to getting here to this place? You know, we were doing an interview yesterday and Kamau, you were saying very nice things about me <laughs> in a way, in a way that actually like, it's the kind of praise that can like make you uncomfortable because you're like, stop saying so many nice things. Um, but, but actually you were really, praising my, the kind of white person that I am, right? And, and, and I think that when I think about my journey to get to being the kind of white person that I am, which I, you know, in your words is like a white person who gets it. Um, and again, I think what makes me uncomfortable with that kind of praise is that I, the bar is so unbelievably low that I don't think anything that I do is remarkable. Um, I mean, I think I have lots of skills and talents. I'm a good writer. This is all great. But like when it comes to my journey of being anti-racist, I just think I give a shit. And I learned how to listen to people and believe them. And I really, truly believe that my liberation is bound up in the liberation of everybody. And I learned that early on. I feel like I like flipped a switch at a young age. I grew up in a pretty progressive liberal household, but I also grew up in predominantly white institutions for a lot of my life. Um, I got a good undergrad education at UC Santa Cruz. I read Angela Davis when I was 17, <laughs> I, and it made sense. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the place that gave Huey P. Newton a PhD. That's where Angela Davis was a professor. I mean, yeah. it's an it understatement. Sounds, yeah. It sounds, UC Santa Cruz sounds like, what are they major in, surfing? But it's actually it's, like... <laughs> it's one of the most radical camp campuses in the, in, in, in yeah. the world. And it, and it worked. It had a really big impact on me. How, how do you enter this space. I, I meet white people often who, who are, um, who get it, who give a shit. I, I, I'm an activist, I organize with folks, so I tend to organize with those kinds of white folk, right? Mm -hmm. how, how, do you, how do you recognize that you get it without becoming so self-satisfied that you don't see your own blind spots? Oof. Uh, I mean, I've, I've definitely come up against many of my blind spots many times, and I try to be really honest and self-reflective and learn from it when that happens. Um, and I just try to enter the spaces humbly and quietly, which um, is not always my style. I'm not super quiet, but um, I try to come in with respect and um, patience. Is it and the solidarity solution? Which one is that? Which story is that? Yeah, about how you came to oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the, I, one, one of my many moments of messing up, I tell the story in this book, is that I started an activist organization in 2016 to kind of try to get women um, in particular motivated and engaged. It was before the election, um, and I wanted, you know, I, again, I was finding all these people in my community, which was a lot of white moms, like middle class white moms in the Bay Area, kind of being like, what do I do? I don't know how to take action. So I started a group to get people involved, and um, we called it Solidar uh, we, we initially called it Suffragette Sundays. And I was like, yeah, we're gonna like, people are so excited about Hillary, we're gonna like pull on this. And in my mind, because I've, I've written books about 
women's history, and I'm like, there's a, all these black suffrage activists, and it's really, and, and that's what we called it. And we went on for a few months, and we built this big Facebook group, and we had all these people coming to meetings, almost all of whom were white. And uh, after a few months, someone said, you know, I heard through another friend, and then another person told me, they're like, yeah, I'm not gonna come. Like, that sounds hella white. Um, like, yeah. and, and it was a black woman who was like, <laughs> yeah, she was like, suffragette Sundays, like, are you kidding me? And I was like, oh, okay, all right. And, and I acknowledge in the story, at first I was like, God, but I really like that name. Right. Like, <laughs> I was, I'll be honest, I was like, God damn it, that's a good name, it's alliterative, like, I like, it was getting people involved, <laughs> um, and it, but I went through that, I had my moment of like, darn it, my great idea didn't work, and then I was like, okay, we'll change the name. Right. Um, and we talked about it, and we changed it, and then it was, everything was fine. <laughs> right. Because, but that takes a, both one a sense of history to, to read and understand the context of why being a suffragette doesn't doesn't exactly connect to Black women, yeah. right? Um, but also a willingness to listen, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's part of what this book is. Come on, what about you? I mean, so as I've talked about before, I grew up in a household where my mom, like, she was born in 1937, uh, so she and she was born in Indiana. So that means 1937 in Indiana is like 1850 in Mississippi. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I mean, so she really has is. all the stories of, of like, she was in segregated schools, then went to high school, was in integrated schools, but they put all the black kids in remedial classes. Mm. Uh, and just, and everywhere she went, she was the first black person to, we've never had a black person walk down the street before. She was that kind of person. Right. And so that was, and I used to have a joke in my act that I was 11 years old before I realized that a cracker was also a delicious snack. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good, it was a good one. It was it's one of my rare good ones for my early career. <laughs> and so it was always like the talk, and I was an only child, so I was always hearing the talk. That was the talk of the movement, the talk of the man. And But I was just a kid who wanted to be a stand-up comedian because of Eddie Murphy on SNL and I, Bill Cosby. And I don't have more to say about that because I did a four-hour documentary about it. <laughs> uh, and so I felt like as I progressed in stand-up comedy, I got I sort of got pulled into wanting to talk about the things that I'd been around my mom, my mom's work, you know. And I never could figure out how to make it work until I just sort of hyper-focused on it. It's like this is I think this is what I'm here to do. And but then once you do that, it's like it becomes clear that like at some point it can't just be about the jokes. It's got to be about your life. Yeah. And so then it becomes like, I remember people used to call me an activist just because I had jokes that were political. And I realized that's not an activist. No. And I read, you know, Dick Gregory. Like Dick Gregory understood the difference between being a comedian who jokes about racism and actually going to the march. And that there's a difference. And he at one point quit doing stand-up comedy just to focus on activism. And so the more, the older I got, the more kids I had, the more, the more democracy started to clearly crumble before our eyes, the more I became invested in the fact that like the lane that I have taken up in in show business is a lane that I can actually like connect to the outside world and really take, pe hopefully take people who are watching about these stories on in my work and go now go do it in your community. So for me, it just became like, I, you know, it's it felt like I couldn't go any other way. I I don't think I could be Kevin Hart if I tried. Like I, even though we both have comedian on our on our tax forms, I just realized this is where I belong and this is where the best work is going to be done. And and I really sort of like. I feel like my mom handed me the baton and it was lighter than when it got handed to her. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this generation, I'm in danger of handing my kids the baton and being like, sorry, it's heavier. Mm. <laughs> and so I feel very much like, you know, it just becomes, it's very clear to me what my job is here to do. And, that, and, the, and, and if I'm, you know, every time I go, man, it's really hard to be a comedian who wants to do activism and wants to end anti-racism. The ghost of Harriet Tubman shows up, is like, oh, is it hard? Right. <laughs> <laughs> is it hard? You're having a hard time? <laughs> 70 black people I freed from slavery. Are you having a hard time? <laughs> so I really have tried to get out of my ego about it and also try to, and the same thing when people say nice things about me, it's trying to be clear that like, it's, if I get my ego caught up in this, it's, I'm, I'm all over. Wow. Let's play a game. Mm. To call or not to call? <laughs> all right, I'll read them up. I'll read, I'll read them out, I'll read the scenario, and you tell me which one you would do. You're walking your dog in the park and you see a black man. <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> 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 <laughs 
he asks you to put your dog on a leash, which is the, which is the law, which is the law. What do you do? A, you put your dog on the leash. B, you ignore him and keep walking your dog. After all, who is this guy? The leash police? C, you threaten to call the cops. You even pull out your phone to pretend to call the cops. Or D, call the cops. Who says A, put the dog on the leash? Who says B, ignore him and keep walking your dog? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Frankly, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, 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 I think I'm the one who wrote, who are you, the leash police? I think <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> How many say C, threaten to call the cops, even pull out your phone to pretend to call the cops? Mm-hmm. Sure. Okay. <laughs> and who says D, call the cops? Okay. Uh, the answer, we hope for A. We accept B. <laughs> <laughs> But we got some combination of C and D when white lady Amy Cooper came across Christian Cooper. Y'all know that. He was the, he's a bird watcher. Harvard, that you need to be a Harvard grad to, to not be harassed. But I mean, there's probably no less a threatening black man <laughs> than a Harvard alum bird watcher on Memorial Day <laughs> in Central Park. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is what make white people amaze me, man. They saw 50 Cent, yeah, yeah, you know? Exactly. Yes, yes. And uh, she threatened and eventually did call the police. Luckily for Christian, he recorded the interaction. And even luckier for him, the police didn't come. Amy was charged with filing a false report. Luckily for her, the charge was dropped after she completed a therapy program on racial bias. <laughs> Just kidding. That wasn't luck. That was the system of white supremacy protecting a white woman. That was good writing. Oh, yeah. That's that was damn good, good stuff there, <laughs> y'all. All right, I'm going to do one more. Um, <laughs> you own a golf course. I feel Congratulations. Like d- <laughs> right. <laughs> I feel like right there. <laughs> um, you see a group of five black women on the second hole. You think they're playing too slowly. What do you do? A, nothing. B, ask the group of white men behind them if the black women's pace of play is bothering them. <laughs> this is my favorite book event we've done. I, know, I just want to be I clear. Know. Just read the whole book. Let's just keep going. You should do the audio the book. Audio book. Right. Yeah. Oh, man. C, confront them about their play. I want to be there when that happens. All right. Um, or D, call the cops. <laughs> I haven't heard this stuff in a while. It's really good. When the dispatcher asks you if one of the black women has a weapon, respond, other than her mouth, there's not any weapons. Okay, <laughs> share time. Who says A, do nothing? Who says B, ask the group of white men behind them if the black woman's pace of play <laughs> is bothering them? We should turn off the lights so this I know, is right. <laughs> oh, we need like a buzzer or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> C, confront them about their play. Okay, oh, we, got one. we got three, thank three, you. we got three. Thank you also, uh, four. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I, I won't point, but four. Um, or D, call the cops. Okay. All right, I got to do one more. I'm sorry. This is... Well, tell them what happened. Yeah, oh, what happened? right. I'm sorry. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm spoiling it. I'm like, the awkward to see what I see. First of all, good for you for owning a golf course. We didn't, <laughs> we didn't know you had it like that. <laughs> Damn! In 2018, Steve Cronister, the owner of York, Pennsylvania's Grandview Golf Course, chose C. And after the women didn't immediately do exactly what he said, he went for D, calling the police twice, since they didn't come the first time. Uh, my, my Nika Oho, Sandra Thompson, Karen Crosby, Sandra Harrison, and Carolyn Dow were quite literally guilty of nothing, except maybe being the only black people playing that day. Luckily, the police realized how absurd the calls were, and the women didn't end up arrested or dead. I mean, part of why this comes up, and I want you all to talk about this before I read another one, is, and I don't know if the internet just made it bigger or whatever, but there seemed to be this rash of white people using the police like their customer service hotline. And <laughs> it was like anything that happened that they didn't like, yeah. we saw on the, uh, It was like, can I speak to the manager? Yeah, the yes, poli- the yes. Po- the police was the manager. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, so the thing I think is so amazing about that, and we, we even developed the word Karen for the type of white yes. woman who does this, because uh, it's often a white woman. I think it is amazing to me that if you are a white woman who's about to do this, that you don't, you don't even think about the fact that you're about to come off like a Karen that you're so disconnected from your whiteness that you're like, I'm, my name's not Karen, I'm Sandra. You know what right. I mean? <laughs> like, 
that you don't even, in the way that like black people, anywhere we go, we know if a black person did something wrong there, we need to sort of be aware of where we're do- what we're doing. Yes. Or not did something wrong. If a black person got caught up in trouble there, we need to, like, if you're, if you're a black person who's watching Birds in Central Park, you're always going to think about Christian Cooper. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't watch Birds in Central Park anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Central Park is closed. Close closed. Like, National Geographic, Nature Channel, I'd be home doing that shit. Man. I would be nowhere near. I'll let David Attenborough tell me about the birds. <laughs> right. <laughs> let me, I'm, I want to show a hands. I'm going to, I'm going to move. Uh, when it comes to doing the work, what are you worried about? I want to show, put your hand up if this applies, okay? When it comes to doing the work, what are you worried about? Check all that apply. Not knowing where to start. Losing momentum. Burning out. Getting sleepy. (laughs) (laughs) Feeling overwhelmed. Fucking up. Staying positive. Saying or doing the wrong thing. Losing friends and family. Not doing enough. Not being able to integrate racial justice work into my life in meaningful ways. Forgetting to do the work when I promised to do the work. Having patience. Being an introvert who's not used to speaking up. Feeling confused about what to do and when. Feeling snacky. (laughs) <laughs> oh, nobody feels snacky? Snacky. We, we ate a lot of snacks while we were writing this book. Yeah. Snacks, had to. snacks were critical. Snacks were critical. So he was doing other stuff, too, to give some of this humor. I, I'm, I'm fascinated um, by two things. One, I, I, I want to, something has happened in the room that I want to acknowledge, right? The most resonant thing in here, I think, was fucking up. So many people said that they feel concern, trepidation, whatever, about making mistakes. I, wanna, I want us to own that and feel that, right? I want us to and kind of hold a little bit of space for what that means, because all of us do justice work, all of us who do justice work, we're going to mess up. It's unavoidable. And, it, and the more you care about doing this work and doing it well, the more that fear is going to get ratcheted up. To what extent... And Kate, I, I want you to talk about this a little bit. Um, I think it's too easy for a comedian to talk about this. Um, <laughs> I, I can be funny too. No, oh, I don't doubt <laughs> it. it. Right? No, it, it ain't the comedy piece of it. It's like right now, com- comedians talk about cancel culture all the time. It's like mm. a tick with, with comedians. You can't mm. get them to talk about anything else, right? Not you, but a lot of them, right? Mm. We live in a moment right now where it feels sometimes like people are like, "Gotcha." Mm-hmm. Where people are waiting for you to make a mistake, mm-hmm. right? Where there's no room to say, you know what, I messed up. We have a political culture that says, oh, you're, you're, you're for women's reproductive justice? Well, 1962, you weren't. And it's like, well, yeah, I feel differently about it now, right? But there's no room for that. How, how, do you, how, do, how should we, all of us, navigate this feeling of being terrified of fucking up, to use your language, um, when it's inevitable that we're going to fuck up? Yeah. I think, and we talk about this in the book, you know, the way that we say it is it, the, the issue isn't what are you going to do if you fuck up, and it's, I'm sorry that we can just keep saying the F word, but I feel like it just really works in this moment. Um, it's not what do you do if you fuck up, it's what are you going to do when you fuck up, right? And yeah. so I think for me, I just try to focus more on how to apologize, um, what repair looks like. Mm. Um, and how you can, look, nobody wants to fuck up. Like whether it's in, you know, social justice work and activist work, or it's with your kids, or it's with your partner, or it's with, no, none of us like to be wrong. We don't like to hurt people. I mean, I'm going to just kind of assume that about us in here, assume best intent that no one in here wants to harm someone. Um, And, but we are going to at some point. And I think that if we can really focus not on the panic of what is, what is going to happen and actually do work to prepare ourselves for what we will do when that happens and what that can look like and whether that's, reading about apology and repair. We include resources in the book about books yeah. you can read about what that looks like um, and really thinking of, you know, of what will you do? What, and, and I think part of that too is looking for examples in our culture um, and also looking for examples in your own life for times when someone has hurt you and, you know, thinking about like when has apology actually really landed with you? When has someone like apologized in a genuine way to you and then how could you do that if and when 
actually when uh, you know that happens to you and and to see it as an opportunity for growth. Um, I, <laughs> we keep making Peloton references. I still ride my Peloton that I bought during the pandemic. <laughs> I swear to God. I rode mine three times. One of my favorite, one of, but like one of the like instructors I really like, she always, anytime she's getting to the hardest part of the workout, she's her whole thing is she'll be like, all right, this is gonna get really hard. So what you have is an opportunity. Like this is when you get stronger. So she's never like, this is gonna suck. She's like, this is your opportunity for when you grow and get stronger. And it's like easy to say this now, it's harder to to feel that way in the moment when you have fucked up yeah. but like that is how we grow and get better is it's like when we do it wrong and then we learn come on you talk about in the book the the sense of um how it hurts when you hurt people or, or to make these mistakes right mm -hmm. do you ever feel sort of as a black person that you get positioned <clears throat> in, in these conversations sometimes we become the de facto authorities mm -hmm. what does that mean for creating space for you to make mistakes or you to understand, you to grow and learn? Because it seems like people are always looking to you to be the explainer and the healer and the grand poobah of, of, mm -hmm. of, of race. I mean, it's literally why I call people like you. <laughs> it's why I'm very clear on the fact that like, I'm here to sort of guide you to the knowledge, but I'm not the knowledge. Uh, I dropped out of a college. Uh, you may not have heard of it. It's called the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I dropped out after a year and a half. Uh, so I'm very aware that that any. This is why I get caught up. I get I get very careful about my ego. Anytime I get like, let me explain, and I'm serious, it's about to be bad. So as much as I know, often white people come to me and go you know, like you're doing all this blah, blah, blah. And anytime it's asking for advice from me, I'm very quick to point them to somebody who actually knows what they're talking about and has the authority. And like really not getting, thinking of myself more as the conduit to knowledge than the actual seat of knowledge. Well, this book is a conduit to all sorts of knowledge, all sorts of brilliance. Um, it's powerful. As you can tell, even in the, the activities we did together, it creates space for humor. It creates space for knowledge generation. It forces you to be reflective and self-critical. It forces you to ask yourself tough questions. But it's also a book, uh, in my estimation, that's perfect for this moment because it's brimming with hope. The odds are against us. There's a reason why we're not optimistic that things are gonna work out, right? All the evidence in many ways is against us, but the evidence has always been against us. The evidence was against the ending of slavery. The evidence was against the lack of, you know, women getting the right to vote. But at every moment, those of us who care or as the song says, we who believed in freedom would not rest until it was won. And one of the weapons that will be used to help us win this battle is this book. I strongly suggest you read it, buy multiple copies and share it with friends. Give it to that uncle that makes you uncomfortable at the Thanksgiving table. <laughs> he needs to do some work shopping. Do it you with know. that uncle? Yes, do it with that uncle to make sure it gets done. And make sure you do the work. Don't be proud to own this book. Mm. Be proud to work through this book. It is a workbook for a reason. This was an incredible contribution by two incredible people. Um, and I just want to thank you two for this work and thank you for this amazing conversation. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Did somebody, did somebody write down everything he said? I was just going to say, did, did someone record that? <laughs> yeah, we, could, we could use that. I'm going to write that on the blurb with a Sharpie. Oh my God. We should make like, oh, I just had an idea. This is like my, my marketing brain working. We should make like Thanksgiving um, like placemat, like table settings from oh, the book. Yes. <laughs> like a white, like a privileged checklist for Thanksgiving. Oh. Yeah. People can color. Oh my God, this, this, this actually works. I, I like yeah. this. Andy, Andy, are you coming up or do we need to do something else? Oh, we do have time for the audience questions. Oh, yeah. So I did my rousing conclusion way too early. Well, damn. It's like, it's like when an NBA player thinks it's over and it, no, it's the end of the third quarter. Right. Oh, <laughs> that's how I was headed to the locker room. Right. I, damn. That was, that was good. Was it was really good. good now you got to top it. White yeah. man ruined my day. <laughs> Which is the it's name the of shit Mar they talking about in this book? <laughs> <laughs> it's the name of Mark's new book, White Man Ruined My Day by Mark Lamont Hill. Right. We could just do a That's few my CNN questions. memoir, actually. <laughs> All right. All right. I teach in a Quaker school with a clear focus on DEI. 
I've been surprised by parent pushback to what some consider a too liberal approach to DEIJ. Wow, I know what school that is. Do you have any suggestions for how to partner with parents who clearly aren't ready to do the work? I mean, this is why when people see the book, they sort of very quickly go, is it like either is it for kids or you should make one for kids? And I'm like, no, 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 it's the grown folks who need the work. <laughs> and so for me, this becomes about figuring out a way to engage with the parents that's not really about their kids. Yeah. That's about like, what do you want? What do you expect us to do in this space? Mm-hmm. And then so we did an episode of United Shades of America about woke and critical race theory. And one of the questions I, I would ask people is like, People are like, I don't like this CRT in the schools. I don't like it in the elementary schools. And I was like, well, first of all, if your kids are learning CRT in elementary school, congratulations, they're geniuses. Because <laughs> that's law school. Uh, but also, forget that. Do you want your kids to learn an age-appropriate, accurate history of this country? And people generally go, yeah, I want that. Then it has to include these elements. Why, what is it about these elements that make you uncomfortable? And the fact is, it's making the parents uncomfortable. It does not make the kids uncomfortable. Yeah. And so for me, it's about like, this is why we made this book for adults, because it's about engaging the adults in this, because honestly, we're the problem. It's not, we act like the kids are the delicate flowers that, what if they find out it's us? And so I think it's about like figuring out a way to talk to the adults about themselves and about what, they, what they're expecting, not about the, like take it out of the kids for a second. Mm-hmm. I, I agree. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good ally. Um, which is what the next question is. What things do allies do uh, that frustrate you? And I, I want to expand that beyond just um, allies in the racial justice front because I want both of you to answer this question. Mm-hmm. Because whether we're talking about LGBTQ rights, whether we're talking about indigenous rights, allies do stuff. We're all allies in some space and we all do mm-hmm. stuff. So um, what things do allies do uh, that frustrate you? Uh, th- not enough. Mm. <laughs> like, they don't do enough. <laughs> that, that's frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I also think the kind of um, uh, the kind of um, you know the wanting credit, the kind of cons- the, the the kind of need the constant need for like validation or credit mm-hmm. or like you know like we always joke like a, you know a cookie um, you know like but like this idea that they they showed up they did something and like tell me I did a good job. Mm-hmm. Um, that's I think that can be very frustrating. I think getting caught up in symbols instead of the work, thinking that the symbol is the work. Mm. Uh, George Carlin has a great line, symbols are for the symbol minded. Uh, (laughs) Mm -hmm. uh, And I think symbols are important, but we have to understand that it just, it's it's representing something that's pointing to something else. If it's not pointing to anything else, then it doesn't mean anything. So, and so for example, there was that day in 2020 where a bunch of people started turning their Instagram squares black and it was supposed to be for racial justice. And I was like, and I felt bad, like, oh my God, I didn't know, I'm supposed to know these things. As again, I'm the expert. Mm-hmm. How did I not know? And I texted my friend Alicia Garza, who wrote the forward to the book, co-founder of Black Lives Matter. And I was like, what's happening? What, why didn't you tell me? She's like, I don't know what this is either. <laughs> and we both realized this was just some internet meme culture thing that like some white women held on to. And they're like, this is how I proclaim I'm doing racial justice. My Instagram square is black. And what else? That's it. Right. And so for me, I think a lot of times we can get caught up in the symbol, but not actually in the work as allies. So mm. I'm a big believer in, uh, in T-shirts being an effective form of communication. So I wear a lot of, of T-shirts. Uh, this is from Run the Jewels last night in uh, D.C. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but this, but like, so I have a T-shirt that I wore on, I've worn on TV a bunch. I think I'm wearing it on TV tomorrow. This says, I will aid and abet abortion. Right. Now that's a great T-shirt. It's from, <laughs> it's from shoutyourabortion.org. So I didn't make up, I didn't come up with a t-shirt. You can buy it from shoutyourabortion.org. But it doesn't mean nothing if I'm then not partnering with reproductive justice organizations, sharing ways to donate, encouraging people to donate, donating myself, spreading the word about all these reproductive justice organizations in the South, like the T-Fund, T-E-A-F-U-N-D.org, or the Mississippi Reproductive Ju- uh, Freedom Fund, or the, Al- or the Yellow Fund in Alabama, these are th- real things, you can write these down, that are actually trying to figure out how to get people out of those states to states where they can get abortions. If I'm not doing that, then it's just a T-shirt. You know, I wanna push back just a little bit though. Please do. Um, I agree it's not enough to just wear the t-shirt, yeah. but there are real stakes attached to the, you all being in the public sphere as public figures 
taking certain positions, right? Mm -hmm. A man wearing uh, a short a, a shirt saying that he's going to aid in a bed abortion at a moment where liberals often won't say the word abortion. On CNN. On, he right, that shirt. on CNN of all places, right? And they, they, they tricky sometimes, I heard. <laughs> you know. <laughs> the, <laughs> you, I mean, I'm just saying there's something at stake to do that. It's like, it's like when white people were wearing, you know, um, shirts that at the time that said Black Lives Matter as, as opposed to just, you know, you know, I always said like the I can't breathe shirts are a little weird to me because you can breathe, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But, yeah. but black, affirming the, the life of black people is important. You know, affirming the lives of trans folk is important. I, I do think there's something to be said about symbols Mm -hmm. Although I agree that they can't be, I just don't want you all to underestimate the work, yeah. the, what it's, the, the commitment you all have and the work, the, the, the way your work matters. No, but I, also this, I'm like several years into this work. If mm -hmm. you're a person who's never done any uh, reproductive justice work or, or done anything to help in, and the first thing you do is buy the t-shirt and you wear it, then you're actually starting to do the work. Yes. I Yes. Yes. So, so buy the T-shirt. Please buy the T-shirt. Everybody wear the T-shirt. The T-shirt. If you buy the T-shirt, it supports these. The uh, supports training for people who are helping with the board. It's a great T-shirt to buy. And even buying the T-shirt is a part of the work. I did, here's what I think. It's back to the working out thing. And you know this because you clearly work out sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> if you're doing the same amount of weight your first day at the gym as your like 1,000th day in the gym, you're not working out anymore. Right. So for me, it's like I'm deep into this. And and let me be clear. The day that I was going to go to CNN, I was going to promote United Shades of America at the Mothership in New York, and I had the T-shirt, and I was like, am I going to put this on? Am I going to wear this? What if I get in trouble? What if I get yelled at? What? And I'm like, "Who? What? you're a 49-year-old man. <laughs> <laughs> you got three kids. <laughs> Who's yelling at you? Like, what does trouble mean to you? Yeah. And then you think about that, that good trouble, the John Lewis trouble. And so yeah. I wore the shirt all day long. A couple times I held it up when, they, when, the, when the lower third was covering it up. Yeah. And then later that night, Tucker Carlson called me a CNN ghoul. So that was the trouble I got oh, in. Oh, then you won. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that made it all worth it. So, and believe me, with the work that I do, and I know the work you do, and the work you do, there are times where you go, this might be too far. Yeah. And you sort of go, and I me, this is again, Ghost of Harriet Tubman moment, like, but also like, what are you really here to do in this life? And that's the thing that, what is, it's me, it's the universe challenging me to go, are you really about this? Yeah. And some days, you, some days I'm not, some days it's like, not today. But if I'm always saying not today, then I'm not really about it. Are there any patterns or type of humor that help negotiate difficult conversations about race? Mm. I mean, if, if the humor question is always interesting to me because people say this, things to me like, how do you figure out ways to use humor with this difficult material? And, I'm, and I sort of want to be like, first of all, if black people hadn't had humor, <laughs> we would not be here right now. Right. If we hadn't had art, we wouldn't be here right now. So it's not like I sit at home and going, man, that racism is bad. Let me come up with some jokes. <laughs> <laughs> like I sit at home and go, man, racism is bad. Ghost of Harry Tubman. That's funny. I should write that down. <laughs> like, it's, the, it's, the, it's my natural response. Every com everybody in here has had a conversation with somebody about a serious thing that somehow gets to a joke or you laugh. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, mean you, it doesn't mean you're not serious. It just means humor is a natural way to to get a conversation going and to release tension. So my thing is lean into those moments. I think sometimes we sit down, I'm ready to have a conversation about race and racism, mm -hmm. and you sit down and it's not gonna be a good conversation because you're not really in your body and you're not really connecting with the other person. When somebody laughs, you know they're paying attention. We can all pretend to pay attention and just do, mm, mm. Mm -hmm. but if you connect with somebody and they laugh, you know they're paying attention. So I'd say just like get comfortable in letting the conversation go where it goes, and if you think of something funny to say, say it. Mm. Mm -hmm. I have a question. It says Stanley Tucci? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> Is that really what it says? Stanley Tucci? Question mark. That's funny. <laughs> you should keep that one. The. <laughs> that is my answer, literally. <laughs> I love United Shades of America. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> How do you decide the topics, people, and locations? How long are you there? It's funny, because I realized when I was coming here today that I, we have been to, th we, we did an episode in Camden, so we stayed in Philly. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, <laughs> smart man. I, I mean, I wasn't in charge of booking it. I'm just saying that's what happened. <laughs> Uh, but we did an episode of Camden season one about pol- uh, community policing in Camden. Yes. We did an episode. I don't. The seasons start to blend together. We did an episode about uh, uh, environmental justice and toxic environments and toxic and and we did part of it was here in um, in Philly and part of it was in Chester, uh, uh, where I met Zuline Mayfield, who's an amazing person. Uh, and then we did an episode season the this past season about majority minority cities, Philly being a majority minority city. So I mean, it's weird how much we have come to this area for the show. Uh, you know, because you all know, everything's happening in Philly all the time. It's, where's their trouble and strife? Philadelphia! <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, but the topics, a lot of times it's two things. One, either the news gives us an assignment, like you feel like the news, to- like the news basically told us you need to do something about woke and CRT. Like, I, yeah, I really wish we didn't have to do that assignment. That was a hard episode to shoot, but it came out very well. Uh, and then sometimes it's about, like, I'm always trying to figure out who are people we haven't, like America either misunderstands or doesn't talk to enough. So we have an episode this season uh, that we did it uh, on the Pine Ridge Reservation about, about the land back movement, about Native American activists who want the land back. Uh, and so to me, it's like, how do you, so it's that combination of either things that you feel like you have to do because everybody's talking about it and nobody's getting it wrong, or like we did an episode this season about uh, black folks in Appalachia, because nobody's talking about it. So it's like, for me, it's just like, it's that sort of like, things you sort of have to do and things you really sort of feel compelled to do because you, nobody's doing them. And then it's, uh, many of the, like this season, uh, t- two of the episodes were really from me, one which was California wildfires, because I live in California, and so I came and like, we have to do a California wildfires episode. And then the episode that's coming up this weekend that we filmed in New York about Asian Americans and media and a little bit about black and Asian solidarity and how it gets sort of weaponized and, and doesn't work all the time and stars a bunch of my friends. Lisa Ling is in it, Harry Kondabolu is in it. Oh. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a fire episode. Sophia Chang is in it. So yeah, so it's, it's a, and then some things are like things that people bring to me and I'm like, all right, we can do that. Like we didn't, we, did, we have an episode coming up in Hawaii about people moving to Hawaii during the pandemic and sort of thinking they discovered Hawaii. <laughs> I mean, that happens in neighborhoods in Philly, too, yes. I guess. <laughs> Fishtown. Fishtown. You think <laughs> I feel good that I know that reference. Yes. <laughs> Nobody's ever been. <laughs> uh, so, and it's about, and I'm really proud of that episode because it is, I, I love giving people who are angry, righteously, the microphone and just letting them go and just being like, and I just sit on camera like... <laughs> Thank you for making the COVID vaccine PSA. I showed it to patients. This is not a question, just a comment. I showed it to patients who would listen to you and get the vaccine. Mm. Thank you. So I, I want to say something about that because I was in. I, so a friend of mine said he was like, "Can you? We want to make a COVID nineteen vaccine. This is before the vaccine was even out. We want to encourage people how to deal with COVID. So when the vaccine comes out, they'll be ready. And specifically about." black and communities of color. And they were like, can you help, can you figure, find somebody in the Bay who can direct a commercial like that? And so I sent him to my friend, Jake. I was like, he can do it. And then, uh, can you find somebody to write it? So I sent him to my friend, Adam Mansbach, who uh, just, he's a great writer. Great. Yeah, great and funny. And, and uh, he's, a, he's a white guy that gets it too. Yes. Uh, I only hang out with those types of white people. Uh, <laughs> I, ma- I married one of those types of white people. So, so, uh, they were like doing, they were like, they were putting it together and then Adam reached out and said, hey, come out, we did, we're trying to figure out somebody to host it, we think you should do it. Mm-hmm. And I was like, can't you find somebody more famous? <laughs> <laughs> the answer was, uh, they said they wanted me, but to me it's kind of a failure of people in my industry that they won't do more stuff like that. Mm. Like I just feel like it should be really especially with COVID really attacking black communities. Yeah. Like it felt like, I just felt like I'm happy to do it, but I also feel bad that it's me. <laughs> like just, and I'm not trying to have, be humble about it. I'm just like, on the scale of celebrity, I'm like an eighth of a celebrity. <laughs> like just on the, if you, oh, you know, you know, so if me and Rock walk, if me and The Rock walk down the street, nobody sees me. <laughs> uh, so I just, if me and Kevin Hart walk down the street, I'm security. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, but to me, like, I really, I did it. I did several of them. They called me back to keep doing more. And I, every time I was like, I just wish, I sort of was like, I wish there was somebody we could get more people involved in this work. And I've seen a lot of celebrities sort of equivocate on COVID and the vaccine because it wasn't good for their brand. And I think it's just, this is why I feel like, again, that's this, me going, are you really about this work? Mm. <sighs> this is the time where we're going to um, wrap up. You got a big speech prepared? <laughs> I, I, I don't. We're going to get this one on this video. This feels so anticlimactic now. I feel no. awful. I feel awful. Um, this is that fucking up moment we were talking about. Um, no, but seriously, I, again, I, I can't stress enough how important it is uh, to read this book and engage this book. Uh, also, to s support this book today at, at the Free Library of Philadelphia is also to support a, a local black bookstore, Uncle Bobby's. So it's win-win. So I want to make sure that you all have time to, and, and you'll get all the housekeeping instructions, but I want to make sure you all have time to go out there, get your book signed, the multiple copies of the book you're going to purchase for friends and family. Um, and most importantly, I want to just encourage everyone to go out there bravely uh, and continue doing the work of leaving this world a little bit better than we found it. Good night. God bless you.